Hello, it's David. Today, a little bit more work on the STE uh, that I've got out here. I'm still doing my work on uh, the Falcon uh, Booster DFB1, uh, but um, a little bit of something in parallel at the moment because uh, SD RAM is getting me down, always does. Uh, anyway, so today my plan is to uh, prepare my STE for a TOS upgrade. I want to fit uh, erasable EPROMs. The uh, Exos store fairy has been, and I've got a couple of brand spanking new uh, M27C1001 uh, EPROMs, uh, UV erasable uh, ROMs. These are blank at the moment, so they are brand new. Um, so I shall uh, be preparing myself uh, a copy of TOS 2.06, and then probably lastly EMUTOS, uh, for uh, for my STE, but there's a few things that we have to do first in order for it to be compatible. There are some jumpers on the board that we need to sort out. So I'm going to open up and have a quick look and see what we've got in here. So I uh, don't have any screws in this case. Got the Falcon keyboard in, so hence the uh, dirt and the strange colours. Been well used. Uh, okay, no shielding, obviously. Um, so the full four megabyte uh, uh, SIMs in there. And I've got a GoTech in here as well. So uh, the um, the ROMs, the the the, the EPROMs, uh, as they will be, are located under the floppy drive here. Let's just move the keyboard down a little bit. And I've taken the screws out of this already. There we go. And there we are. Those are our two mask ROMs uh, as shipped uh, from factory uh, in the STE. Now these are custom chips for Atari. They are only 28 pins. You can see that there's four pins left over actually at the number one pin end, uh, which um, for us to put in uh, our 32, more standard 32 pins in. But over here in the corner, we've got M10, sorry, it's W102, 103 and 104, which are our three jumpers uh, that control how these chips are read. Now at the moment they've got uh, what look like uh, resistors, end on um, resistors uh, soldered in there. They're probably zero ohm links. Uh, but it turns out uh, that these are set incorrectly for a 32 pin ROM. So I'm going to have to change them. So I could get in there with a soldering iron and lift one leg and solder the others and maybe put a, uh, an SMD component across there and cut off the, uh, the remainder. But it's, to be fair, if you're going to do it, let's do it properly. Let's make it easy to replace. So what I should propose to do is to whip the motherboard out and put uh, header uh, pin headers in here so that we can actually use proper jumpers and uh, select it um, if we want to change ROMs uh, in and out. So that's the task for today. And first things are obviously let's get the board, let's get the machine disassembled as, as much as we can and get the board um, out of the uh, the case, which is something I never like doing, but there's only one way to work on the bottom. So the Falcon keyboard that I'm trying to protect by keeping it in the SCE is getting another workout. This is a lot stiffer than on the Falcon, on account of it's been removed far fewer times. There we go. These are completely interchangeable. Whilst we're here, let's have a little look. Look how lovely and clean this is. This was picked up off eBay for about £70 uh, in a, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it was sold uh, as working. The only fault I found with it was the keyboard, which is currently in the Falcon, uh, has a, um, I think the joystick right is stuck down, and I've not yet got around to fixing that, but it's just a keyboard fault. And you see, when I put the Falcon keyboard in here, it's absolutely fine. Uh, Noticing a few differences here between uh, this and the uh, the Falcon layout. Uh, for example, over here next to the expansion joystick ports, these are all just links, whereas those are uh, inductors, little um, ferrite beads in the uh, in the Falcon. Everything's a lot more nicely spaced out. We've got a uh, a socketed 68,000. Uh, don't know what that would have been. Glue chip, I'd imagine. Probably some DMA over here. 
famously uh, lots of arguments about DMA on the STEs, uh, mostly down to just poor bus design rather than anything to do with the chips, I think. Uh, anyway, yes, no, uh, I really should spend some more time on the SCE. If I ever get the Falcon uh, accelerator uh, finalised, then uh, the STE will be the next one in my sights. Although I do intend to spend more time on the software side once I've got the Falcon in a state that I'd like to work on it. These little keyboard pegs, very stiff. They're so stiff, I'm going to leave them in. Better take the power supply out. Obviously, different power supply to the Falcon. This one, I think. No, it doesn't. I was going to say, I think it carries a minus 12 rail, but uh, I can see no evidence of that. Uh, that's the ball screw. That's screwing the actual circuit board to the, uh, the caddy, whereas uh, it's the caddy itself I wish to remove. Just going to be a little bit careful about this because uh, this was plugged into the mains a couple of hours ago. Uh, there's no obvious way to get underneath those capacitors and discharge them. And you could get a an unfriendly little 400 volt bite if you're not careful or if you're unlucky. So fingers crossed. Hmm, that's uh, that's not being very friendly. What's holding that in? There we go. Just a little pressure, bit of pressure towards the rear to release those legs, and that I would suggest is overdue a recap. Uh, See my previous video about the Falcon recap. This one in particular doesn't look very healthy. Just looking at the way that the sun, and the sun, <laughs> no chance on daylight today. When the uh, the, the way that the uh, the lights above move across the surface, you can see this one is distinctly convex, as is this one. These two don't look too bad, and this big boy looks okay. But yeah, I suspect we're a little bit overdue on that front. Well. Probably about 20 years. Ah, and here we go. We've got another lovely big chip under there. What's that? Is that going to be the memory management unit, perhaps? I don't know my STEs at all well. I did, I did have an STE back in uh, back in the days, but only very briefly. I started with an STFM and tried to do a memory upgrade. Botched it so badly that the uh, uh, the people who tried to um, salvage it for me and felt sorry for me and gave me an STE instead uh, for the uh, to. Um, to do the uh, much simpler memory upgrade. Uh, but I only had that maybe a year or so before I um, I bought the Falcon uh, early adopter, which we had to be with the Falcon because there was uh, there were no late adopters. Uh, and so the majority of my um, Atari uh, experiences were on the Falcon. Right, this is very nice and clean. Let's see, how shall we uh, proceed? So, the ones that go through to the case. Actually, I'm just going to take them all out. Don't worry about which ones are for shielding later on. Are we going to have to unscrew? the rear connectors I imagine we probably will but they hopefully they'll come out of the uh, case first before we have to get that far seems to be pulling forwards Something's catching. Oh, 
It's that damn shield that uh, annoyed me so much on the Falcon. And that little flimsy one around the power connectors. Just the backboard one, horrible. Okay, so now we do unfortunately need to remove these one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, little connector terminals. I think I tried to do this with a um, uh, tried to do this with a sockets set last time, but uh, it turned out to be easier just to use the pliers. Fortunately, I've loaned my needle nose pliers to my son. So I've got the uh, round the corner ones on the job today. Now I suspect I shan't be using this um, shielding again. I had a terrible time trying to get it off the um, these coaxial phono connectors on the Falcon uh, to such an extent that I think it's probably completely unusable again on, on the Falcon. I imagine it's going to be the same here. But I shall cry no tears. And that is not how to do it. Electrically, that would work fine if I put it back on. So I'm not remotely concerned uh, if it turns out that it's absolutely uh, a vital part of, uh, of the SCE and it causes terrible, terrible interference without it. Then it can go back on like that. But I suspect it's going to be for the bin. Okay, so that's caused more damage than I would like to the real shielding. But now we should be in a position to coax the board out of the bottom shield proper. We do that by just moving these tabs away slightly. Uh, this is I've got the feeling of a missed screw here. This this feels more reluctant to rise than I uh, than I was expecting. Oh no no no! It's just just is those tabs. I think there we go. We'll correct that one a bit. There we go. There we are. Hello. It is in very good condition. This one, I was incredibly lucky with uh, with that particular eBay purchase. Happy with a lot of mine, to be honest. Good. So uh, nice to see that we've got uh, a topless shot there. I believe that what length of wire running across the back of the board is uh, from factory. And I think these are our. Here we go. Yep, these over here in this corner are our little uh, jumpers that need to be need to be removed. So I'm going to start off with a bit of flux. And when I say a bit, I mean one hell of a lot of it. What I do not want to do is damage this board by piling too much heat into it. So I'd rather be cleaning it than repairing it. I'm going to start quite low. So I normally do my soldering around 290. I'm going to take it up to about 300 just... Uh, because it's an old board. And I think the uh, recommended trick here is to introduce extra solder and then try and uh, suck it away. So in we come for the extreme close up. And I'm going to try, as I say, to introduce a little bit of extra solder. See if I can get it to flow. And maybe we'll try with the uh, the desolder iron initially, but this is a little bit overkill for uh, such a delicate operation like this. So 
So if I don't like the results, I shall change back to the wick. Try not to apply too much lateral pressure. So that's the sort of thing that causes the desoldering pump to skip across the surface and wreak havoc. Yeah, not, not really the desired outcome. I think one of them worked quite well. So let's uh, just get in there with some wick. And see how we do. That one should just be an empty hole. Should that? Ah, that one has cleaned the hole, that's good. Trim that brick down a bit more, that's, that's uh, taking up a lot of solder. This one looks almost clear. As does that one. That doesn't look bad. Perfect. Very good. Okay, so a couple need a little bit more work, but otherwise not too terrible. I'm going to grab the uh, bridge from underneath and just see if I can coax this out. There we go. Right, we're out. I would say that is a zero ohm link. One down. Okay, I've grabbed the next one with uh, my tweezers. Can feel movement. And it's out. So let's just see what the holes are like. That one will be perfect. That one is also not too bad. Splendid. Look at that. Great. So I need three of these uh, three ways. We'll pop it back through. And then we will be solving those into position. Trying to solder with too little flux is incredibly frustrating. Trying to solder with too much flux is very messy. But I would rather be messy than frustrated. Which 
I think can be read a number of ways. Okay, so I have my three two-way header strips here. I'm just going to pop. I'm going to try popping them all in at the same time. Which may be asking for trouble. I'm then going to take a piece of polystyrene foam or whatever this is and squash them into there in the hope that that will hold when I flip her over. <laughs> Straight away it fell out. My piece of polystyrene foam is not tall enough because I've got the uh, got the floppy disk standoff still here. Okay, let's try that again. Maybe we'll try one at a time. I need more foam. So sit first one in place, shorten this. This occasion, hold it with my finger. And this is where you have to try very hard not to just incinerate your finger. So trying to hold it from the left hand end as we look, so I can solder the right hand in first. So I'm going to put a little dob of solder on there, uh, of flux on there, sorry, just to make life easier. And then with the iron, which back down now to 290, I'm just going to get myself a nice flat blob of solder on the iron itself and try and introduce that to pin one there. And there we go. That's now held. I'm going to try and repeat that process for the other two. Trying to hold the alignment best I can. A bit more, a bit more sold on the tip. Straight on. There we go. Now we can do the others at our leisure. So as I was saying before, you need less flux, but it's an old board. I don't want to damage it with too much heat, so why the hell not? Uh oh, I think I might have made that one too hot. It's fallen out. So I better start with the far side on this one. There we go. So, less likely to inadvertently heat its neighbour. I must have just touched it with the uh, with the um, iron, I think. So, we've got a slight correction job on the top right one. Okay, well, I went away and did that off camera because it was a little bit fiddly. What I ended up doing actually was just uh, using a uh, the back end of the tweezers here. Uh, to apply a little bit of upward pressure and then went over uh, these uh, three pins again with um, the warm iron. And now just tidy those up. Okay, so now our jumpers are in. I think uh, the thing to do is to try and replace the settings that we had uh, for the two um, stop bombs and make sure the machine builds. Uh, sorry, make sure the machine boots. Okay, so we've replicated the original configuration, which was 232323. Power supply is connected and hot, and we've got the monitor attached. So uh, fingers crossed, and let's throw the switch. White screen. Uh, no floppy. 
so that's probably uh, to be expected. There we go. We've got we've got the menu. There's no keyboard. There's no mouse. There's nothing I can do. But uh, perfect. We've not introduced an error. We've not introduced an error with our fiddling. So we've now got some swappable jumpers in place. We can move on to working on our ROMs. Okay, so just quickly, I'll show you how to take out the old chips. I've pre-labeled them here as high and low for storage. Uh, now there's a variety of tools that you can use. There are specialist uh, bent end uh, levers. Um, I haven't got one of those. Uh, there are uh, chip puller tools like this, uh, which uh, uh, sit over the top and help you to jimmy it out. Although I find um, these are good for finishing the job, but personally I wouldn't rely on these uh, completely because I think you're likely to go pull, 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 oops, and end up with a whole load of bent sockets. There's the good old electrician screwdriver. But I always think to get started with these, if you can, if there's room, you should start with the biggest wide tipped screwdriver you can, jimmy under the side and twist the screwdriver. So, you know, you're applying force. So you jimmy under slightly one side and you're applying force to the center. And you can compensate a little bit, move it across left and right. If one side's coming out slightly higher than the other, work a little bit on that side, come around to the other uh, and repeat. And then once it's far enough out, you can fall back to the uh, electrician screwdriver or the uh, proper pull tool. If you start straight away with the electrician screwdriver, there's not much twisting benefit you can get there. It might just sort of like get you started, but you, you're then into shoving it under and levering, and you don't know what you're levering against. If it's a socket edge like this, you can say it's going to be fairly safe, but uh, you know you might be levering against circuit board. Once you, if you go in far enough to actually provide any height, you might be actually then pressing against the circuit board itself and causing damage. So slowly, slowly catch your monkey. So I'm going to start uh, with the wide screwdriver. I'm going to come in from the, uh, uh, the side just under here, and then I'm going to twist. There we go, look at that, and that's just coming up a little bit. And that's enough, you don't want to go too far because we don't want to bend the pins and we've got to get in the other side. So we'll repeat that for the low chip. There we go. Now, if we can get the uh, the wide angle, uh, the wide head screwdriver in this end, because by leaving it up like that, we're closing the gap at this end between the socket. So if we can get it in, great. But I don't think we can on the uh, on the high. Maybe we can on the low because the sims are in the way for the uh, the high. Uh, no, not quite. Okay, so then we fall back to the electrician screwdriver. which we should be able to get into the gap between the chip and the socket. And initially it's just the same thing again. I'm going to, I can't quite get in there. Let's try that again in a second. Go on this side. Initially it's the same idea. We just twist slightly. There we go, just lifting, lifting gently. I'll go back with the flathead on this one. And that is virtually out. I could probably do that with my fingers, but to make sure that we apply an even uh, pressure, I'm going to now come in with the proper removal tool. Oh, there we go. Actually, that was virtually completely out. So the high chip's a little bit more awkward because of the amount of uh, um, uh, items on the board, in this case, the, the sims meaning I can't get quite as low down with the screwdriver. So here I may try and rock it gently with the extraction tool. And this really should be trying to be as gent absolutely as gentle as you can to apply some pressure. Intending not to move. In fact, if anything, I've just maybe lowered that down, but that's probably okay. I can then come back in, still not with the flat, come back in with the screwdriver and maybe start from this side. Perhaps the trick on this particular 
chip would have been to start from the left. There we go. I'm actually, you see, these are going back in, but I'm lifting these up, up sufficiently on this side. And I can now very gently coax the other side up as well. There we are. They're both now half out. And there, no pins damaged. And we can keep these for uh, falling back. Oops, <laughs> if I don't smash them up first. We'll keep these for falling back or might even uh, introduce an adapter board later on that lets me uh, mount the original chips plus my EEPROMs and a switch. Although, to be honest, if I did that, I might just go for a larger EEPROM and switch the, uh, the top address line. But good, now we're out. We can move on to burning those EEPROMs. OK, so we're going to move on to programming our new uh, EEPROMs. And the way I'm going to do that is with my almost ubiquitous uh, uh, XC, uh, um, sorry, I forgot my number, uh, the TL8662 Plus. These are pretty much the de facto standard for hobbyists. Um, they can take up to a, a DIP40 that, and we've got DIP32, so this will deal with this fine. And the way we're going to do it is to take a, uh, a 256 kilobyte uh, TOS image. So TOS 2.06 and TOS 1.62 are both 256 kilobytes. That's why we need two 128 kilobyte um, EEPROMs. And we're going to take this image, we need to split it into two to program half onto one and half onto the other. But it's not, for example, the first uh, 128K on one and the second 128K on the other. No, no. The way it works is that these two chips are eight bytes each. They're data output lines. Uh, there's eight of them. So one will be doing effectively the odd bytes and one will be doing the even bytes. Now, because the STE is a 16-bit computer, we refer to these as, as the high byte for the most significant bits and the low byte for the least significant bits in a 16-bit word. So what does that mean? Well, when we go and get our image, which I'm sure we will source completely legally. We shan't be typing in TOS images collection onto the internet or anything like this. But so when we've got our TOS image, I'm going to save it into this directory and it's going to be, I'm going to rename it to uh, TOS.image. We can see here it's 256 kilobytes. And if we have a look at it with a hex dump, We'll see that this is how it starts. At position 0000, we have 60001, 2E, 2, 02, 306. So the first 16 bits are 602E. The second 16 bits are 0206. 0206, that just happens to be the TOS version. This is TOS 2.06. So this is an easy way to make sure that we know what we're doing when we split these in two. 60 is going to be the most significant, or if we look at this one, it's easier. 206, most significant, least significant. So this is the high byte, and this is the low byte. So the first byte we read is going to be the high, the second is going to be the low. So we need a program that's going to split this file into the high and low bit, uh, the high and low byte, output, so two files of 128k. Now there are various programs that do this, most of them run on the, uh, the ST itself, and you pull uh, your ROM in image in and it will give you a, a high and a, a low. To be honest that's a lot of hassle, it's a lot easier these days to run it on a more modern computer, and the easiest way I think to do it is with a Python script. So I've knocked together a really really simple Python script here, uh, which uh, will do this job for us. So this I'm going to put on uh, my GitHub page if anybody's interested, uh, and this is absolutely 
very basic indeed. There's hardly any error checking at all. And I'll talk, take you through quickly what it does. So first it looks for a file called tos.img. So you must call your input file tos.img. It opens it in binary read mode. It then opens high image and low image in binary write mode. And then it goes through a loop where it reads one byte from the input file and writes it to the high output file. So the first one it reads goes to high, then it reads another byte, this time from the, oh sorry, this still from the input file. So the second byte it reads, it then writes it to the low file. And this loops throughout until it runs out of bytes to read, then it closes all the files. That's it. So, because I'm a C programmer, there's also a, a C version, the same thing. But you can see that's a bit more long-winded and you would need to compile it. So the Python version is the version I'm going to demonstrate. And you can see here I've got my TOS uh, 2.06 image and all we have to do is to run Python 3 high low byte split dot pi. It should open that tos.img and create us a high and low output. So now you see we have tos.img which is 256 bytes and a high and a low which is 128 bytes each. Now we just check to see which one's which. We're expecting the high byte to have the 2 of 2.06 uh, and the low byte have the 6 of 2.06. So let's hex stump the high. And sure enough, we get 6 0, which is the first byte of the, uh, of the file, then 0 2. So that is correctly identified as the high. And let's repeat that with the low. 2 e, second byte of the file and then 06, so this is the low byte, so that's the 06 part of TOS 2.06. So now we have to write these files to our chips. So firstly, I've labeled them up with a, an H and an L, and we'll start with programming the high. So the way that the 866 program works, the this end, you can see in the logo over here, this end is for pin 1, and you can see that this has a little notch here to match that image. So we're going to drop our chip in there and lock it into place. We're going to use the Mini Pro programmer. This device comes with its own Windows software. I don't use Windows, so I'm going to use the command line Mini Pro programmer. And this, you have to tell it which chip you want to use. Now these chips are Not quite sure that's going to focus, but these chips are M27C 1001s. So I happen to know that the correct name for the Mini Pro is M27C 1001 at DIP32. It's the 32 pin DIP package. M27C 1001 at DIP32. And sorry, we uh, specify that with P for that's the uh, that's the type of of a programmable ROM that we're going to use. And the easy way to make sure that it's all working is we'll ask it, minus B, to do a blank check. So it's read the chip ID OK. And in 1.2 seconds, it's verified that the section is blank. So we'll remove that. From the programmer and repeat that process with our designated low chip. Chip ID is OK, code is blank. So since I've got the low chip in there, why don't we try programming this first? So the command line to program is instead of blank check, it's minus W for write, and we'll go for the low image. So mini pro minus p m27c1001 at dip32 
right the low image. Label my chip low. So this tells us what it's doing. It's got a programming voltage of 13 volts. Main VCC is 5, VDD 6.5. And this is just the different voltages you require to program these old um, ultraviolet erasable uh, EPROMs. So we'll sit and wait for that to complete. And we can see activity here on the Mini Pro itself. And so after the code is written, it performs a quick verification check and shows that it's OK. So here we go. The light's gone out. We can, uh, we can now remove our EEPROM and perform the same operation, this time on the high image. And here we go, the code is written and the verification passes. So now we can take our freshly burned EEPROM chips, put them into the STE and see how we get on. Uh, just a tip because, or if you, if you have new, brand new uh, EEPROMs, you'll find that the legs are quite splayed uh, when you uh, when you go to mount them so the trick is take a flat surface and just gently roll the legs just a little bit so that they'll fit into the socket so let's go and look at that now okay so the uh, mask ROMs are out our jumper configuration is still set for the originals, so uh, we're using these uh, 27C1001s. Uh, so check in the schematic. Uh, 27 c shows that uh, we are looking at 23... Uh, sorry, no, 1, 2, 2, 3, 1, 2. There we go. So we're currently all 23s. So this now should be a simple case of us changing these two. to two and three. Uh, sorry, it's one and two. I will get this right. One, two, one, one, two, two, three, one, two. So one, two, two, three, one, two. Okay, and here's our low and here's our high. So we'll take our low chip first, I think. The pin one marker is over here on the uh, on the silk screen and also on the uh, on the socket. So the pin mark, mark, uh, one marker on our low chip is over here. So we're going to bring this around. Going to put the far pins in first. Make sure they're nice and straight. And okay, you get this problem if the chips are quite new you get this problem that they don't quite fit in on this side. Now, you can take that away to the table and straighten them up, as we discussed, just a little bit. And when they're close, you obviously want them to have some pressure, so when they're close to fitting, you just apply, make sure they're nice and snug on the far side, you just apply a little bit of inward pressure until the ones on your side, there we go, slot nicely into place. So we'll repeat this now with the uh, with the high chip. I think this one's is a lot more inward straightening. We'll do the same. We'll go in with the far side first, and then apply pressure away from me until I can see that the near side will slot in. There we go. So with the jumpers correctly set, the chips securely in place, 
Let's reconnect our keyboard, put in the power supply, we'll try and power her up. Okay, so my Falcon keyboard is, is in place. Um, using that just to try and keep it away from general wear and tear. Got my GoTek lined up here. We can try and uh, apply a disc. The power supply is connected. The monitor is connected. The power supply is switched on, but it's not connected at the wall because I'm a coward. These heat sinks on these supplies are live. Don't like working anywhere near them, so I should do my connection uh, on on the wall. So let's point up at the monitor. And here we go, I'm plugging in now. The Atari sign. Terrible alignment on the screen. And the disk drive seeks. Let's see if we can give it a, uh, a readable file. And here comes the TOS 2.06 memory test. Turn up the screen a bit. Four megabytes. And it's reading the disk, which is our old friend, the MS DOS install disk. So nothing to boot but there's the desktop and you can see that the distinctive green checkerboard from TOS 2.06 uh, and above is here and our desktop info shows up to 1991 so the upgrade is successful got our blue options there excellent perfect so I'm going to get the machine reassembled and I'm going to call that a win.